Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Spiritual Leader Podcast, and it is a great privilege to be able to minister to the Lord and with His people, and it's my prayer that uh, you're having some freedom through the uh, spring and upcoming summer months to really uh, express your faith through ministry and with your family, and I pray that today uh, you'll enjoy these few moments with me as we continue our journey of leadership for God. You know, the Bible is exhorting us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so today we're going to study the topic of what does it mean to stay the course? What does it mean to be faithful over time? A few days ago, uh, I had the opportunity to celebrate my 60th birthday. And for those of you that have perhaps reached that milestone, you probably would agree with me in saying, where did the time go? And I don't feel like I'm 60. Um, I will celebrate in a few weeks my 37th year of pastoring Lancaster Baptist Church. And the same thing is so true. Where did the time go? And I guess what I'm saying is I've been at certain things long enough now with respect to ministry and marriage in particular Uh, that I feel uh, I can share a few thoughts about how to stay the course. Now, I can tell you that in my own heart, uh, every part of my being wants to finish well. And so there's uh, much to be said about remaining faithful and resilient, but also much more to be said about finishing well. And certainly that's all of our goal. But I think about this matter of staying the course and taking a journey. And whenever you go on a nautical journey, there's going to be the charting of that course and uh, setting of the direction. And certainly when you're a younger man or woman in Bible college and you're kind of trying to look out over the horizon and figure out where's this all going to go, God doesn't reveal it all to us at once. And uh, so some of what I want to share with you today is really just in retrospect, looking back at the journey that God has given to me. But I think you'll find a lot of commonality And I think you'll find some lessons along the way as well. Something I like to say to our staff is that if a spiritual vision will survive, it must be accompanied by a strategy of faith. If a spiritual vision will survive, it must be accompanied by a strategy of faith. And so today, I would like to share with you some of that faith strategy that God has blessed along my journey as a spiritual leader. And we're gonna do this in two podcasts. Today we'll start with five principles. And I want you to think about these with me. My journey really began as a journey of soul winning. And I know that sounds very basic. I've had people in my earlier years wanna argue even about the term soul winning. Uh, And people like to say, well, we're not the soul winner, the Holy Spirit is. And you're like, okay, thank you very much. Uh, But the Bible does say, he that winneth souls is wise, and the Bible obviously commands us to be witnesses and to preach the word of God. And so when I use the word soul winning, it reminds me of my responsibility to Matthew 28. And when I came to Lancaster in 1986, there was no administration to speak of. There was no counseling. Uh, We had a few funerals the first year. We didn't have weddings for a long time. There wasn't a lot of pastoral duty. There there were no invitations to go speak anywhere, no school, no college. There was just one basic burden on my heart, and that was the fact that there are people who will spend eternity in my city in heaven or in hell, and that Jesus Christ was the answer. And so everything revolved around soul winning. Now, it's easy to view witnessing, door knocking, soul winning as step one in building the church. But what I want you to know as we discuss this for a few moments is that this is a step that we must continually take all the way through our journey. You see, we have one great commission, and that, of course, comes from the captain of our salvation in Matthew 28. And there's so many things about it that I love. He says, all power is given unto me. And that word power is the Greek word excusia. It describes the ranks of power, uh, even mentioning the demonic realm and the fact that there are many realms of power. And Jesus says, but I have all power. And, you know, I'm so thankful for that. And I look back in my life and I know that as a younger man, Uh, And even today, standing here, uh, 
all I have to offer to God is a yielded heart and a surrendered body and life to him. Um, the power is not of me. And the power is all of him, and it's all of his word. And I'm, I'm thankful for that because on this journey of soul winning, time and again, I've had to realize that uh, if the Spirit of God isn't working through me, no one's going to come to Christ. And if the Word of God isn't properly expounded, no one will come to Christ. So Jesus said, all power is given to me. And then, of course, I love the part of that verse 20 where he says, lo, I am with you always. Uh, what a wonderful partner for these 37 years to be uh, partnered, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. What a tremendous privilege that is. And I really do believe that the best remedy for a sick church is a soul-winning diet. Uh, a lot of times churches become sick because they're focused on themselves. They're, they're focused simply upon their programs. But if we can keep a church focused on the fields that are white or ready to harvest, uh, it's amazing. I, I've, I don't know that I've ever had uh, contention or dissension from someone in our bus ministry or someone who's faithful and soul winning at our church. It just rarely has ever been the case. People that are involved in reaching out to others and compassionate uh, tend to be people that get along and they see the team spirit is so, so very necessary. I know when I came to Lancaster, California, of course we had uh, no salary for 16 months. We were really kind of a home missionary project. But I would go out and knock on over 500 doors a week and I did that for more than 16 months just knocking on doors. And sometimes uh, I'd come in on a Sunday morning looking for my visitors and they weren't there. But then suddenly God would bring people in that I had never met before. And I'm just a believer in this principle, that if we take care of God's business, he takes care of ours. We sow the seed, he brings the harvest in his own way, his own sovereign way. But for me, this has been a journey of soul winning. And I'm like you, I miss opportunities. Sometimes I forget to carry a gospel track or forget to talk to someone. But throughout the week, I wanna still be practicing the Great Commission. I like to say to our staff, let's keep it real at the baseline. Our baseline is our walk with Jesus. Our baseline is, is living out what we expect others to live out. And in the area of soul winning, uh, I want to be a part of that public meeting once a week, getting out into the community and telling people about Jesus Christ. And so we have one great commission, and we must live with eternity in mind. Um, I love what Spurgeon said about being soul conscious. Spurgeon said, brethren, we must plead. Uh, we must make entreaties and beseechings. They must blend with our instructions. Any and every appeal will reach the conscience and move men to fly to Jesus we must perpetually employ if by any means we save some. In other words, everything we do in the ministry must revolve around encouraging people to come to the Savior. And so uh, this journey of soul winning, it's been a journey for more than 37 years, uh, but here in this one pastorate, we like to say, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And I've said to our church, if I have to be imbalanced, in a particular area, like a tire that's kind of wobbling off on one side, I want to be imbalanced to the side of soul winning. Now, we work very hard at discipleship, and we disciple lots and lots of people, and we work very hard at expository preaching, and we work very hard at developing our missions program and uh, educating uh, our children with a biblical worldview. Lots of things we do, but if there was an area that I would willingly lean into, and, and someone might say, he's imbalanced in that area, if it's getting the gospel out and helping people to know Christ and be on their way to heaven, I'm okay with that criticism. And sometimes as leaders, and this is the Spiritual Leadership Podcast, we need to ask ourselves, are we leading others into the fulfillment of the Great Commission? And if not, why not? And what is more important than that? And so this has been a journey of soul winning, and uh, I want to encourage you on your journey uh, to sharpen your witness and, and to let the Lord continue to use you. You don't just win souls as I did for 16 months to get on salary at the church. It's not just about reaching a benchmark like that. It's really much, much deeper. It's the command of Christ for his church. The second aspect of my journey is what, what I like to call a journey of servant leadership. And as I think about this principle of, of the spiritual leader journey, 
Uh, I, I must honestly tell you that I knew very little about servant leadership in my first four or five years of pastoring. Uh, I knew a little bit about leading. I'd seen a lot of great leaders. I'd been around a lot of strong people that led, but not always biblically so. I don't know that they intentionally guilt-tripped people, but sometimes it felt like that. I don't know that they intended to shame people, but once in a while I think I saw that happen. Um, I don't think that they meant to try to raise offerings by false motivation, but I think I saw some of that too. And, and as I uh, came out uh, of college and, and some early ministry experience and began to try to lead, you know, you, people do what people see, and I just kind of tried motivating people in different ways in, in order to get them involved. And, uh, and the Lord really began to work in my heart initially through just some criticism uh, that I had from some of our early members, maybe about maybe the tone of a message or something of that nature. And uh, some of you might know me better than others, but, but I've always felt you can learn from criticism. And, and sometimes God will bring maybe an elderly lady in the church to tell you something, and you, you need to be willing to listen to that. I think what God really did in my life, and I wrote about this in my book, Guided by Grace, what he really did in my life to begin to teach me a little different leadership style was when a couple of the strong mentors in my life who were very dominant uh, leaders and strong people, uh, when they fell out of the ministry. And I had to step back uh, through a season of brokenheartedness and tears, and I had to ask myself, how does this happen? How does someone so dogmatic and so authoritarian suddenly just wash up like that in the ministry? And I began to realize that God is, is truly looking at the heart and God truly wants us to look to his son, the Lord Jesus, as an example for our leadership style. So I've been on a lifelong quest to become not just a better leader, but a more Christ-like leader. And someone might say, well, I remember back in 1984, you know, you weren't a very Christ-like leader. And I'd probably say guilty. Um, but I'm, I'm pressing on the upward way, doing my heart's best to conform to the image of Christ. And I think uh, one of the passages that helped me was Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to be a minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And it's my desire uh, to lead this way and to model this type of leadership, uh, to teach it in our college here at West Coast Baptist College, to teach it at the leadership conference. Every year there's a lesson somewhere along the line of this principle. Uh, I truly believe that Christ repudiates status seeking. Uh, you go to Philippians chapter two and you study what is known as the kenosis passage where Jesus emptied himself, not of his deity, but of the prerogatives of his deity. And uh, he took on the form of a servant and he humbled himself and he became obedient unto the death of the cross. And I know that we can preach against people just wanting their comfort zone, and we preach against the idea of just being lukewarm. But I'm just here to tell you that, that leaders can get there. And uh, we, can, we can say, you know what? It's not easy to go make a hospital visit. It's not easy to stay and try to help this situation or that situation. But the Son of Man did. In fact, the Bible commands us, for example, in Philippians 4.9, to use hospitality one towards another without grudging. And one of the ways we've tried to show servant leadership is by having every kind of a person you can imagine into our home. And uh, in a few weeks from now, we're going to have a bunch of young couples that are new to the church. And I anticipate some of them probably have a marriage problem, some of them still using vice and different habits they're working through. But the whole idea is to serve them where they are. And, and so the journey for servant leadership is another one of those areas that you don't just utilize the terminology servant leadership to a point in your life, but you keep asking the Lord to open doors and you keep walking through those doors of servanthood uh, as you go forward. Uh, we recently had uh, graduation uh, here at West Coast Baptist College and it's always a sweet time for me and, and frankly kind of emotional because uh, you really you, you love the students and then you're sending them all over the world. 98% of our graduates were placed on uh, graduation day, 100% of them completely free of debt. So those are good things. And then you send them out. And I was telling some of them the story about 
a young man that began a new job at a, at a, a shopping center and uh, he got checked in through HR and he went and told his boss he's reporting for work and and uh, the boss uh, the boss gave him a broom and, a, and gave him a couple of cleaning utensils and said, all right, here you go. I want you to sweep this floor and clean that window over there. And, and the young man looked at him and he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, I just graduated from college, you know, I'm a college graduate. And the store manager said, oh, I didn't know that. Here, let me show you how the broom works. And uh, a lot of times that's how it is. Uh, people are like, well, I've been to college, I've been to seminary, I know a little Greek or whatever. Uh, I don't do windows, I don't do this or that. But I believe that all of us need to remember along this journey of leadership that we never arise above uh, certain tasks and that we want to maintain the heart to serve. Dr. Curtis Hudson was a wonderful preacher from the state of uh, Georgia and uh, he was an early mentor of mine. I remember when we were thinking about going to two services and starting ladies classes and just doing some things that were relatively new at the time, having screens in the auditorium. Uh, Dr. Hudson was a promoter of, of innovation and an encourager, encourager to me in those areas. But Dr. Hudson often said, the measure of a man's greatness is not how many people serve him, but how many people he serves. And I really believe that we want to keep that in mind as the Lord blesses our leadership, that, that we're serving others. And just a couple of ways that I would mention to you that you might uh, not only serve personally, but enhance the servant attitude throughout the church. Uh, something that really uh, has helped us is to expand servant leadership through the small groups of the church. Whether that is your Sunday school, uh, we call them connection group classes, but whatever your small group component is, we like to say that the Sunday school is the church organized to fulfill the purpose of the church. And our purpose as a church is loving God, growing together and serving others. So the way that we do so much of our outreach, whether it's something like Love Works, where we're doing a lot of great uh, community work and then sharing the gospel through that, or whether it is a missions endeavor or even simple things like baby showers and ministering at the time of a funeral, most all of these outreach events are accomplished or these service events through the small groups. And it's important that we teach servant leadership, that we live servant leadership, and that we empower servant leadership through uh, our church and through the small groups of our church. And uh, I just really believe that uh, people are wanting to be equipped. Uh, I just came out of a meeting with one of our men who's just recently retired. And, uh, and he's a godly man. I mean, he made a legitimate decision to stay living in Southern California after retirement so that he could serve God in his local church. And I'm gonna tell you, that's kind of rare these days, uh, but that was his decision. And I praise God for it. And so my responsibility as a leader is to give him opportunity to serve God. I mean, what good is it if someone has a great heart to serve, but we're not strategically creating avenues for someone to be involved in service? And so I like to study the spiritual giftedness of certain folks and find what their interests are and then give them those opportunities to serve. And then of course, I believe another area of servant leadership that we as leaders can look for is to serve uh, the community through ministry opportunities. In other words, to create opportunities that have uh, a soul winning and a serving heart behind them. Uh, I'll give you a few ideas, things that we've enjoyed doing and areas that have helped us to see fruit. Every summer we have the single mom's oil change. And we tell all the single moms in our church and all their friends, come by Lancaster Baptist, come over to our bus garage, we'll pay for the oil, uh, we'll have the men of the church change the oil for you. And just every time we've done that, we've had a single mom or two accept Christ as their savior. And we offer a lot of free counseling at our church. We have a couple of members of our church who have degrees in counseling. We have others that have been through various seminars and in uh, biblical counseling, neuthetic counseling. And uh, we've just tried to serve uh, our members and our community through uh, counseling. Uh, we, every spring, have our first responder Sunday. And uh, we are able through the first responder Sunday to give uh, awards to the Officer of the Year at Palmdale and Lancaster Station. 
Uh, the sheriff came in this year, LA County Sheriff, who's taken a great stand against the ridiculous woke philosophies that are creating cancel culture and defunding the police. And, and we just try to love and encourage those officers uh, for accepted Christ as Savior in this year's service. We fed four or 500 people, uh, these officers and their families, a wonderful meal and just did our best to try to minister, to meet some needs. Lots of counseling comes from that, lots of great opportunities. Um, we, at Thanksgiving time, enjoy uh, finding several hundred families in our community who maybe just have some special needs at this time of year and taking a full basket of food to them, sharing the gospel with them, God has blessed that. We give Christmas gifts to the fatherless in the church, James 1.27, just pure religion, uh, visiting the widows and the fatherless. And we just have found that the single moms and those kids and those families, it literally is revolutionary for them. And uh, these are just ways that we can serve. And, and you know, uh, my wife and I enjoy doing this uh, every year and, and just trying to find maybe a few single moms that we can visit their home, give some presents to the kids, maybe have prayer with them. The list goes on and on. Uh, all of our deacons, we have uh, 35 deacons. Each of them has at least two widows that they call or visit monthly. They turn in reports to me at our uh, monthly meetings, kind of let me know how the widows are doing. It's a spirit of servanthood. And there's probably 20, 20 lists you could make on how to serve. The point is, you never stop serving. You never stop soul winning. It becomes a part of your journey. And uh, this is something that God uh, teaches us in his word. Uh, so it began as a journey of soul winning. And then as you see some people saved and added to the church, it is now a journey of serving because you have a congregation and you uh, have a command in the scripture, by love, serve one another. We're not to use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. But then uh, most of you who are with me today not only understand the necessity of preaching the gospel or, or uh, winning the lost and, and serving, serving the church uh, community, but you also recognize that preaching is central to all of it. And so there's been this journey as a preacher. Uh, again, looking back, uh, I, I was under some great preaching as a younger man, and I, I, t I think of Dr. Tom Malone, who was uh, a tremendous Bible preacher. Uh, and I can think of other men who rightly divided the word. I heard a lot of preaching back then, and sadly, sometimes you hear of it now too, where someone will take a verse and then from there, they kind of create an alliterated outline that has nothing to do with the verse and uh, has a lot to do with philosophy and so forth. And, and it's just one of those things that uh, for someone who's given themselves to a lot of time in the word, it's, it's a little bit disheartening. So the journey of preaching, and I've got a ways to go. I tell you, sometimes I come to passages still and I've got to dig in and open four or five commentaries and, um, and uh, continually develop uh, the text. But what I've tried to do on my journey of preaching is to develop as a textual preacher, a textual preacher. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And what's the key phrase? Rightly dividing the word of truth. And, you know, sometimes uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of millennial uh, preacher friends. <clears throat> and sometimes the millennial preacher friends who really love biblical preaching, they get frustrated when they hear something that's overtly topical or something that's just uh, maybe even passive aggressive in the nature of the presentation. And I totally get that. Uh, I do want to say that expository preaching, though, is not a new phenomenon uh, that's been discovered in the last 10 or 12 years. I mean, I'm grateful for guys coming out of circles where they didn't have as much of it, but there have been some great preachers throughout the years uh, that, that rightly divided the word. Now, irrespective of the history of preaching, in the moment now, we have a command to study it and to, and to preach the text. And so uh, it's a journey uh, that requires uh, prayer. It requires time. Um, I, uh, of course, have uh, outlines that I prepare for our messages, and um, my, my brother Steve uses actually written out texts that he'll write out about 20 pages, typed pages, uh, and, and he preaches from these manuscripts. 
Uh, I typically have about 16 page outline and I use different highlighted colors so I can draw, draw from that as I'm, as I'm teaching and preaching. But the fact is that uh, on uh, Fridays, I've got to give those outlines to uh, our media team for purposes of PowerPoint and we've passed out outlines for 37 years here at the church. People enjoy following along, they can study at home uh, during the week and so forth. But um, if you're not a disciplined preacher and you're just taking maybe one or two words out of a verse and extrapolating thoughts from there, uh, you don't need an outline, you don't need to get anything up on the screens. In fact, some of the most ardent critics of using screens uh, uh, over the years are people who don't have enough content to put up on a screen. And I don't say that facetiously, it's, it's, the, it's the honest truth. But when you're really delving into the scripture and you're wanting to, whether it is define a word or explain uh, you know, uh, where uh, the year of the Chaldee is and in relationship to Abraham's journey uh, to uh, maybe uh, tell Dan or whatever the, whatever the geography is, if you're gonna explain context and if you're gonna explain meanings of passages, uh, it's going to be something that's in your notes. You may want to reflect it in the teaching notes or even perhaps on a PowerPoint. And the point I'm getting to is that preaching is a journey. Becoming a better preacher is not something that I believe we'll ever arrive to a finish date. It's a constant area of growth in all of our lives. And uh, I just want to encourage you, and I know for me as summer months are here now, I think I've got already 10 or 12 books, and some of them are commentaries, some of them are uh, on specific books of the Bible, because I want to keep sharpening as a preacher of the Word of God. Uh, that means uh, spending time in verse-by-verse -verse preaching. I've enjoyed preaching through books of the Bible. Right now we're going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Some tough passages, but I, and I'll tell you something, verse-by-verse -verse preaching convicts me, and it helps me to grow as a preacher. So it's been a journey of preaching. And on this, on this journey of ministry, this, this resilient journey of ministry, it's going to begin with, boy, people need to be saved. And then you get some people, and people need to be served. And, and now you're serving them, but now you realize people need to be edified. And the way they're going to be edified is through the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. And what you win them with is what you'll keep them with. So if you're winning them with Super Bowls and bicycles, there's going to be lots more Super Bowls and bicycles. And there's a place for some of that at Bible school and camp. I get that. But for, for the core of ministry, what you want to win people with is the sound, rightly divided preaching of the Word of God. And that leads me to this fourth principle as we consider our, our leadership journey. This has been, for me, not only a, a journey of soul winning, not only a journey of serving, not only a journey of preaching, but along the way, it has become a journey of discipleship. Now, again, that was not a part of my repertoire when I started here in 1986. In fact, I attended seminars that made fun of the word discipleship. So maybe you don't like the word discipleship. Uh, you choose the term, but I'm convinced that one of the great strengths of the movement I grew up in was the evangelism. I thank the Lord for that. But you know, as a 24-year-old preacher in 26, 27, I'd look around and go, wow, they're publishing that they had you know, 6,000 saved and 3,000 baptized, but their church grew by 12 or something like that. And it didn't really make sense to me. And there was a longing within my heart for fruit that remains. Herein is my Father glorified, John 15, 8, that you bear much fruit and that your fruit would remain. And so uh, we began to really emphasize from day one on this journey uh, the idea of 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, we didn't call it discipleship, but we had a discipling mentality early on. Terry and I would have couples over at least every other Sunday night where we would sit down at our coffee table there, we would teach the Baptist distinctness. Okay, what is a Baptist? Bible authority, individual, uh, autonomy of the local church, priesthood of the believer, uh, two ordinances, individual soul liberty, etc. Uh, what about eternal security? Uh, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we would just go through this kind of a uh, three, four hour sometimes uh, discipleship class just from the scriptures. 
And some of our strongest members today, 37 years later, sat in those moments. And some of them are now serving in churches all around the world. But uh, the fact is that uh, we tried to avoid just the hype of getting numbers out. We wanted to focus on the health of the church. Now, we, we're grateful for numbers. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, and we count lots of different statistics. But we tried to slow things down enough so that people were not seen as just a number. We wanted to invest intentionally. I believe in taking the high road. I have a lot of, a lot of friends that they preach soul winning and separation. I believe in both. But I don't want to just take the high road. I want to take somebody with me on the high road. I want to help others grow along the way so that they can uh, be nurtured into their faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. So disciple making is the central work of the people of Christ's church. It is the bringing of people, both men and women, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and helping them to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, I really was encouraged about discipleship, I don't know, 20 plus years ago in the Philippines. I was with one of our friends who's a missionary there and we went into this 16-story uh, building in Makati in Manila. And there was a long table and about 20 young people sitting around this table and they were going through this intense discipleship manual. It dealt with basic Bible doctrines, it dealt with the church, it dealt with prayer, it dealt with how to witness, how to have devotions. And along with this, many of these young people were writing entire books of the Bible. I mean, they were writing out First and Second Peter by hand. Uh, they, were, they were very much involved in a very intense discipleship program. And my missionary said, when, when my missionary friend said, when they are finished with this, uh, they will be going out to another part of the city, these 15 or 20 young people, and they will be planting our next church. And it just struck me uh, that this was something that was missing in my own church. Discipleship became such a passion of mine that I came back, and I, I grew up in a, you know, you go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, nothing disturbs that. And I asked uh, about 20 or 30 of our folks if they would be willing to go through this discipleship material on Wednesday night. That meant I let them out from under my purveyance, uh, on Wednesday night, they went through the program. Then we began to nurture new Christians and ask them if they would be willing to go through the program, uh, maybe for 12 to 20 weeks, with those that had just been through it. And, and the rest is history. Every year we've had uh, you know, 200, 300, 160, however many adult people that have been saved and baptized being discipled in the Word of God. And uh, it really begins with what we call our core class, our new members class, everybody that saved and baptized over the quarter, the first or second quarter, whatever quarter you're in, uh, we give them some of the history of the church, some of the beliefs of the church, and then we tell them how they can really get rooted and grounded, and we enroll them into discipleship. They've already been coming to church, they're probably already in a small group, Sunday school class. We want to encourage them to take this step. And our journey of discipleship has been so rewarding. Uh, I've written a discipleship manual called Continue. It's available through Striving Together Publications. Over 600 churches use Continue. Just speaking to a man yesterday who is very successful in business, very successful in a lot of areas of his life. But the thing I love about him is every time we get together, he tells me about who he's discipling. And he's taking so-and-so through Continue, and they're on the lesson about how to have devotions. And the church that he is a part of is benefiting from the long-term investment because they're growing with people that are rooted and grounded in Christ. And so uh, I just would encourage you on your discipleship journey to evaluate how are you discipling those people that you are reaching. And uh, it's been a great journey for us. And now we have hundreds of members of our church who've been discipled, who can disciple, who are discipling, and it does not replace the preached word of God from the pulpit. We understand that. And I do believe preaching is the greatest discipleship method. But there's something about the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Oftentimes people that maybe get discouraged and maybe they're thinking about quitting. But they not only got grounded scripturally, but they got grounded relationally with a Christian brother. And when they would have normally slipped out of our average Baptist church, never to be seen again, it's, it's much easier for them to reconnect with that person that discipled them, to work through their issue, and to remain faithful. And so, for me, it's been a journey, and it's been a great journey. It's been a journey of soul winning, servant leadership, biblical preaching, 
And then, of course, personal discipleship. And let me just uh, take this fifth principle with you today, and then we'll finish this up at our next edition of this Spiritual Leadership Podcast. But this has been a spiritual journey of integrity. Uh, it's, it's been something that has been a passion of mine from the very beginning. But the longer you pastor and the more you see how Satan fights and throws darts, the more intentional you have to be, the more vigilant you have to be. And I, I speak here of personal integrity. Um, I think of what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now think of that. Paul says, Now, Timothy, take heed unto thyself. Pre preach the sermon to yourself first. He said, because if you do this, you're going to save not just those people that you're preaching to, but you're going to save yourself. And um, now we don't save ourselves from the penalty of sin and a place called hell. Only Jesus can do that. But if we take heed unto ourselves, we can save ourselves from uh, many of the pitfalls that, that, that wait uh, for a leader. I, I have uh, uh, fellow servants uh, with me in this room today who could tell you there's never been an off-color joke in a staff meeting. Uh, there's never been a, we just don't tolerate a lot of that kind of stuff. There's, there's no room for that. Uh, we really try to work to create a culture that, that pleases the Lord Jesus Christ. And personal integrity really matters. Um, it doesn't matter how skilled someone is or how good they are at singing or what talent they have. Uh, the fact of the matter is that true character eventually comes out. Uh, it's inevitable to find where someone's character really is over time. I used to say, if you want to know someone's real temperament and their character, get them to play basketball with you for about an hour. You'll find out uh, what's going on in their heart because eventually that, that flesh can get pretty active out there on the basketball court. And through the rigors of life, we want to model and live a life of integrity. And so it begins with personal integrity. And the psalmist said in Psalm 139, search my heart, show me if there be any wicked way in me. And uh, you know, it's amazing because let he that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So oftentimes at the surface, we think we're doing fine. Then you get alone with God and you open your heart to the Lord and he begins to pinpoint where pride is coming in where uh, wrong thoughts have come in, where certain neglect of the scriptures have come in. And I think in the right sense of the word, we need to recognize daily that we have a flesh uh, and that that flesh must be reckoned to be dead daily. That we must reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto Jesus Christ. And this is the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. We are not spiritual leaders if we're not having that reckoning very regularly. And uh, repentance uh, is something we speak of with respect to salvation. Uh, whether someone says, I repent when they get saved or whether they're sensing uh, remorse and sorrow for their sin, it, it is the same side of two, uh, the, the two sides of the same coin, faith and repentance. And we believe that there must be this heart of, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me. But that same spirit must continue on the journey of leadership because we must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We must grieve not the Spirit of God as leaders. And so personal integrity and then moral integrity, Titus 1.6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. God wants us to have uh, a life that is, uh, it doesn't mean you're not gonna be blamed, it just means that you are walking upright in your integrity as a pastor, as one who preaches the Word of God. I think about not only personal integrity, moral integrity, I think about doctrinal integrity. I don't want to take the Word and rest out some passage to say what I really wanted to say in the first place. I want to preach the counsel of the Word of God. And I don't want to give an uncertain sound. We see a lot of men today who uh, are uh, you know, adamant about one thing and five years later kind of completely different page. And uh, I, I determined when I came here to Lancaster, I was pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church. I know, I know where I stand as a Baptist. I'm not going to change that. Uh, and I, I just, there's certain things doctrinally that, that God gave to me. In fact, I, I would be a hypocrite to lead this church to change its name, its, uh, view of the scriptures, its view of 
certain doctrine, its view of the holiness of God or the holiness of the Christian life. Uh, I, I think I'd have more respect for some of these guys that are changing so much if they would uh, leave the church that they came to under the guise of one position and just go somewhere else and start new. In fact, I have more respect for some of our brethren who have always practiced a particular way, sincerely as unto the Lord, than for those that are given to much change. I don't want to be a pastor given to much change. I want to have a doctrinal integrity or a unibody approach to the ministry that way. And, uh, and, and, and by doctrinal integrity, I'm not saying that I want to lift my preferences up as being from Scripture. If, if it's a preference, say it. I, I'm okay with that. You have yours, I have mine. But when it comes to the biblical truths, I want to hold to those. Uh, and I want our folks to know that, that there's something consistent here at Lancaster Baptist for them. And then, of course, one other area I want to mention is financial integrity. Uh, just yesterday, we had a meeting with our auditors from Capen and Kraus. Boy, they come in, we pay them tens of thousands of dollars every year to come in here for two weeks and uh, ask every employee questions and look through every account receivable, account payable, all the charge accounts, every kind of a thing you could imagine. And it has been a tremendous blessing for 37 years to have every bill paid. There's been some tight years during COVID. The first part of COVID was very difficult. But God has always provided, and our people have always responded partly because, yes, the Holy Spirit's working on their heart. But they know that if we're bringing an outside group in to evaluate, uh, that there's transparency with that. And the Bible says in Romans 14, 16, let not your good be evil spoken of. So whether it's moral integrity and abstaining from even the appearance of evil or whether it's financial integrity, uh, we want to never give Satan a place to bring accusation against the ministry. And, and this has been a journey. Uh, we didn't have audits to begin with. Uh, we didn't understand some of the ways that Satan would try to destroy ministries, but we want to be wise and we want to grow in that wisdom, James 1.5. So what we're talking about today is the journey of ministry. We've covered five principles today. Uh, the journey of soul winning. Don't ever, don't ever leave off from that part of your journey. Keep that as a part of your daily walk. Let your light shine. Uh, we've talked about the journey of serving. If you are a soul winner and your church is evangelistic, there are going to be people to serve. And uh, it's okay to serve the unsaved in, in an effort to bring them to Christ. Uh, and when you see people saved, it's gonna, you're going to come on the journey of preaching. And don't ever stop growing. Don't get to the place where you're preaching rehashed messages. Uh, I have members of this church been here 35, 36 years. They have maybe heard the same message two or three times, and that was the message I used for certain building dedications. Uh, maybe it's sometimes the same passage, but never the same sermon. And, and work to keep that kitchen fresh with great new fresh messages. And then there's that journey of discipleship. Uh, people are hearing the preach word of God, but they sometimes need the line upon line, a nurturing style of just answering questions in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And then keep the journey of integrity real. Uh, put the checks and balances in place. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. And I believe these are some very important principles that all of us who are on this leadership journey should, should take heed and uh, should just evaluate. And uh, we're going to take some time next month and share five more with you that I hope will be a great blessing to you. I do want to remind you of the Spiritual Leadership uh, Conference this year coming up, uh, September 17th to the 21st. The dates are new. Uh, we're moving to September, and it was awesome last September. And uh, you can visit our website at lancasterbaptist.org. You can see all the lineup of speakers, or you can visit the Spiritual Leadership Conference website. We are excited about the speakers, the workshops, the sessions, and it's going to be a great time. Mark your calendar to join with us here in Southern California for the Spiritual Leadership Conference 2022. And uh, I pray that God richly blesses you and that uh, you have a great month in the Lord.